we're gonna talk a little bit about Huffman coding today. And a part of the challenge in computer science is to take algorithms and data structures that have been taught to you and to learn how you could use those same concepts and apply them to new problems. That's like a challenge in life. And I've already talked to you about different applications for trees. Who can raise their hand and give me one example of how trees can be used? Yes, sir. Binary search trees. Binary search trees. So to store and retrieve information is a good use for trees. Yes, sir. You can create expression trees, and then you can use the, the trees to convert between infix, prefix, and postfix. We also said that trees are good at representing hierarchical data. So for example, I could use it to represent the organization of West Hill, for example, to show who like the big cheese is and who works for whom, that kind of thing, right? Today, I'm gonna to show you uh, another application of trees. This is kind of a wild application that you wouldn't think of initially. And this guy, David Hoffman, who died about uh, 24 years ago, he is the one who came up with this. And so his name is attached to this algorithm. And one of the things that I like about it is that it's so off the beaten track. Like you think about how trees could be used, you'd never think about using it for what he used it for. And we're gonna go over that algorithm today. So imagine a scenario where we have launched this probe uh, from planet Earth. Anybody know what planet that is? That's Pluto. And so we've launched this probe towards Pluto and uh, periodically we send messages to the probe asking it to do stuff. And uh, let's say, just for example, that uh, these are the messages that we send from Earth to the probe. We tell it to turn around or move forward a certain number uh, of miles or maybe turn right some number of degrees, turn left, turn up, turn down. And then if things start to go really bad, we can tell it to reset all of its electronics and hope that you know whatever has gone wrong is gonna get fixed with the reset. Okay, so these are some typical commands we might wanna send from here to here. And we might decide, for example, that we wanna just create a single letter abbreviation because when we send information to the probe, it's expensive. Now, when I say expensive, am I talking about money here? It's time because you see like communicating with this thing is a real pain because it's like really far. And so we wanna make sure if we're gonna send messages, they will have to be nice and terse and whatever. So we, we might have single letters of the alphabet that represent each of these commands, right? So if I send it the letter C, it knows that it has to turn right a certain number of degrees. That might be a convenient abbreviation for each of these commands. And uh, let's just say further that I know from previous uh, probes that we've launched or maybe experience with this probe earlier or whatever, that certain commands are just used more frequently than other commands. So the reset, that's like all hell is broken loose. We don't use that one very often, right? But these other commands like this forward command, we use that a lot. And what you're seeing here are the relative frequencies of how often the commands are used. Does that make sense to you? So in a typical mission, for example, with this particular probe, I might on average send only one reset, but I might need four turn up commands and 15 forward commands. So now your job is to design a system. So here's what I want you to do. First, I want you to look at how many commands are there and how many bits are you gonna need to, are you gonna need like seven bits, eight bits, 10 bits? How many are you gonna need for each command? You wanna use the fewest number of bits possible. You wanna use the same number of bits for each command, okay? So just decide what is the minimum number of bits you can use for this many commands. Then what I want you to do is assign a unique binary code to each command. Like I'll give you a hint, maybe A will be like all zeros and B will be like all zeros and a one at the end like that. So I want you to create that, okay? So create, figure out with your partner, how many bits do you need? Create a unique code for each, each command. And then what I want you to do is I want you to add another column here and put in here total bits. So let's say you decide, this is not the right answer, but let's say you decide you're gonna send eight bit uh, commands for each of these letters, right? That's too many, by the way. You're gonna say you're gonna do eight. So if we did eight bits here, eight bits here, all these are eight, right? So now, in a typical session, how many total bits would you transmit of the letter A? Look, you gotta use two of these columns to figure it out. Look, eight bits each time. How, many, how often do you send the letter A? What's the total number of bits transmitted? 80, so here it would be 80. So you just multiply these two numbers together. And so what I want you to do is add another column and, and figure all that out. Please do that now with your partner. How many bits do you need? 
How, what's the frequency? What's the total number of bits? And then when you're all done, I want you to add this column together. Look, I want you to add this column so that we know in a typical session with the probe, what's the total number of bits we had sent. But right now you shouldn't be confused. We're doing the simple, this is the non-Huffman version. This is the straightforward. Okay, so uh, let's get back together here. Uh, I know you're not done. I just have some questions to ask you. How many bits are we gonna use here in this transmission scheme? Yes, Mila? Three. Three. So how do we know that? Well, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We got seven commands. And I think you'll agree with me that three bits could hold up to eight commands. We got a little bit less, seven. So three, can we do it with two bits? No, two bits would only give us four commands. We got seven, so uh, we can use three. Can we use four? We could use four, but that would be wasteful. And you know, communicating with the probe is hard enough, so we wanna minimize the number of bits. So we're gonna go with a three bit solution. So if we go with a three bit solution, all I need you now is to assign a unique code to each of these puppies. So here, for example, that might be like a unique code for A, and then you just give each one a different one, okay? So if you did that, uh, might look like this. Might look like that, see that? You got a unique code for each of the characters. Got that right? Okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to add a column here and I want you to just multiply these two together. So it's three times 10, three times 15. And why three? Because that's how many bits we have here. See that? We don't care which bits we're sending. We just care that we are sending a bit. So here you would put in here 30 for this column. I just want you to tabulate this column. And then down here, I want you to add everything together to get a total number of bits that we're going to send for this mission. And I want to know what that number is. Make sure you come up with the same number that I come up with. Otherwise, I have to revisit my slides. It's amazing that both of you got the same wrong answer. I think that's pretty amazing. Let's take a vote. Whatever you guys decide is the total will be the answer. What'd you get, Ms. Telesco? I got 174. That's the what I got. Okay, we'll go with that for today. Those of you who got 164, you may have to go back and recount it. Oh yeah, no, it is 174. Yes, I know, Mila. <laughs> Here, the total is 174. Okay, we're good, right? Now, what we want to do is we want to look at this as a tree. Now, you might not think that this is all that conducive to a tree, but we can look at this as a tree. We could call this the code tree. In this case, code refers to these codes, not like the process of coding. And so let's look at this right here. And this could be like a tree that we could create like this. Now, we have seven entries. We have eight possible values for the tree. So the last one's just not used, but here are the different things here. And I want you to notice that we could do something really unique here. Uh, just as a reminder, these are the codes for uh, the, each of the letters. And I've arranged this tree in a special way so that if I were to do this, if I were to put um, zeros on each of the left branches and ones on each of the right branches, like that, You'll notice a very strange thing happens. For example, in my uh, example here earlier, uh, you notice that A was all zeros, right? And B was zero, zero, 001, right? Just to take two examples. Now look what happens over here. A is zero, zero, 0000 and B is zero, zero, 001, you see that? So this binary tree, it represents in a way how to code each of the letters. You see that, right? That's pretty cool, isn't it? We're still not at the Huffman stage though. This is like basic stuff. So now we know how to use the binary tree to represent the codes. That's pretty clever. So here's what we're gonna do now. We have, we have this sequence here, right? So now we know how to encode each of the characters. But what we want to do is we want to somehow reduce the size of the tree so that we can transmit fewer characters and still have each message be clear. In other words, we don't want to transmit so many bits. We want to transmit fewer bits. Uh, and the idea here is that we want to make the codes variable length. So last time we did it, we used three bits for every code, right? Is there some way we can be more efficient here? What do you think? What is your gut telling you would be the key to the efficiency? We want to change. We don't want to send three bits for each code. How should we decide like, which, which commands get uh, which bits, how many bits, etc. Okay, we want to use fewer bits for the characters or commands that are used more frequently. Does that make sense? So this reset command, 
we might want to have be a larger message, but it's rarely used. Whereas in comparison, the forward message, which we use all the time, should have a shorter length. You get that? That, that makes intuitive sense, right? Okay, now, so what we want to do is we want to come up with a variable length coding scheme, a variable length coding scheme. Now, when we haven't talked about variable length coding schemes, but there's a, a new problem to deal with if we have to deal with variable length coding schemes. Let me explain that to you. Look over here. Let's say we came up with a coding scheme like this, where the A code is 00, the B code is 11, and the C code is 1100. Let's say we came up with that scheme, right? You can see it's variable because A and B use two bits to code and C uses four bits, right? Now let's say at the receiving end, you receive this from the transmitter. Can you see a problem? You can't tell whether you got B, A, or C. You see the ambiguity, right? So we say that this coding scheme is lacking something. It's lacking the prefix property. Because what's happening here is that two of these are, one of these is becoming a prefix here. This one here is a prefix for that one. You see that? That's a problem, right? So this code does not have the prefix property. The prefix property means that there's no ambiguity because of the prefixes. So we have to be careful when we design our variable length code that we wanna end up with a code that has the prefix property. We don't want this kind of ambiguity at the other end. Now over here, there was never any issue when we did the, 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 the coding scheme with the three bits, there was no issue about having a prefix property. For example, let's say that I got this message here. There's no ambiguity here. No matter what bits I choose for what messages, how come there's no ambiguity here? Okay, very good, sir. So I just go like this, look, I just go like that. And because I know that each message is three bits, I just break it up into three bit chunks and so there's never any ambiguity. You see that, right? But now if the lengths are variable, I don't know where to put the green lines anymore. So that's where the ambiguity arises. Uh, we're gonna just have to keep this in mind later. Now, I'm gonna show you how this whole Huffman thing works. The way that the Huffman thing works is you're going to find the two items here that have the lowest frequency. And if there's a tie, you can pick any of them, okay? And in this case, you can see that the two that have the lowest frequency are the G and the letter D. You can see that those two have the lowest frequency. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a little subtree here and I'm gonna put these at the bottom. I'm gonna write their frequencies down and then I'm gonna add them together and I'm gonna put that into the parent node over there. And I'm gonna cross out these two because I've processed those already, but I need to keep track of the fact that there's a new node here with a value of four and it happens to process both D and G. Okay, this node represents both D and G. It's got a value of four. And now I'm gonna repeat the exercise. I'm going to look on here and find the two that have the lowest value. Now these are gone because they've been crossed out. Look over here and which two frequencies now have the lowest value? I need two of them. Yes, Mr. F, sorry. E and A. E and A, no. E is a good choice. But if you look over here, there's another one that is cheaper than A. It's this one here. You see that? That's a thing now. Yeah. yeah. So now I'm going to have to combine E and the DG. Well, how do I do that? Well, I just go put E here. And what was that one? A four. And now what I want to do is I just combine these into another node like that. What would be the weight of this particular node? Eight. So let me just uh, show you what that looks like right there, see that's the eight, right? And I'm gonna add the E in there like that. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna draw, I'm gonna just draw some lines here. And so I'm gonna continue building this tree. Now, one of the things I need you to understand is that as we add stuff, it doesn't always add to this connected tree. Sometimes we start spawning a whole new subtree. I'm gonna show you that next now. So we've got this so far. I want you to do the next one for me. It will add to this tree. Just add one more here. Try to figure it out. What, what are we gonna add next? So I'll give you a hint here. So uh, E has been crossed out here, and G has been processed, and D has been processed, but we do have this new node with value eight now, which represents E, G, D. 
but we have that, but that's, that's, that's like a new thing added and these three have been crossed out. So now what do we do? What do we add in now? Mr. Emrani, a. we're gonna add in A, sir. And what are we gonna add A to? What's the other thing that is the cheapest thing here? The, yeah. the existing tree, yeah. right? Okay, so we're gonna add A now here. We're gonna add A and that's got a value of uh, 10. And now we're gonna combine it like this. And this is going to represent uh, A, E, G, D. And what's going to be the, the value of the frequency of that one? We can write it here or we can write it up here. It, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so uh, let's look at what that looks like. That looks like that. Okay, now an interesting thing happens. Now we're going to look for the next two things to combine together. Uh, once again, let me just cross off all the stuff here that uh, is already been processed. So we did this one. And now we have a new node, which is 18, right? And now we want to combine the two cheapest items again. Look at this remaining list now and try and figure out which two things are the cheapest. Yes, sir. C and F. C and F. Now you notice that this time, the two things we've picked are not connected to this tree. See that, right? Neither C nor F are gonna combine with the tree. They're gonna combine with each other. And so discuss with your partner, what do I do here with C and F? Do I somehow like try to put C here and F there? Or what do I do? Mr. Schulzen, what would be your idea, sir? Make a new subtree. Make a new subtree. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, let's look at it together. So now we do that. See that? See where we're going with this, right? And so now, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, we have, uh, we, we continue in this manner. And we basically finish it all up and we end up with this, this tree right here. Now, we started, this was an intermediate step, very close to the finish. This is the finished product. And now, once again, what we do, what we did with the other tree is we put ones on the right ch ch children and zeros on the left children. And now we can, we can generate these codes for each of these letters. So let, let me give you an example. Here's the letter E. Here's the letter E, and to figure out what the code for E is, it's one, 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 zero. That's the code for E. So you can see that that is the code for E right there. Now I want you to notice something in this scheme. You see that the ones that are really frequent, like the A and the B and the F and the C, those are really frequent. They only use two bits. And then stuff that's less frequent, like, um, like D, for example, uses many more bits, and, and G also. Uh, less frequent uses a lot of bits. That's what we want. We want the codes to be longer if we don't send them as much, and the ones that we use a lot, we want them to be shorter. And so we can use this technique here. And here, what does the total bits column represent in this table? It's the same thing. We just multiply the number of bits in the code by the frequency. So this is three bits, 10 times 30. But you notice that now the thing that we use in the operand for the multiplication is not fixed. It's not always three because the codes are of different lengths. So here I multiply by two because there's only two bits here. So it's two times 15, two times 12, five times three. You get the idea? So we generate this column. And what I'd like you to do now is I'd like you to add that column together to see what the total number of bits would be using this scheme. Mr. Nikita, are you finished, sir? Oh, right there, yeah. I did write it down. Okay, 146. So you can see that by using this scheme, we were able to make it more efficient and go from the original number, which was 174 to 146. Now, this is a mild improvement, but in some cases that are more complicated, you can get a drastic improvement in the efficiency. The example that you're gonna do with your partner today, I think the efficiency improvement will be more significant. Now, I should mention to you that when you do Huffman coding, Sometimes the, the, the receiver and the transmitter already have the translation table built into them. In that case, you don't have to send the table. But if you're communicating with the far end and they don't know what the translation is, you might also have to transmit the table also, which will kind of reduce the efficiency because you need to first send a message saying, hey, this is what A looks like, this is what B looks like, etc." We're not gonna worry about sending the actual table. We'll just assume that the two ends already know what the translation scheme is before we get started. Okay, but just keep in mind that in some systems, you actually send the table, the translation table, 
uh, basically this table right here, you send it to the far end so that follow-up messages, they know what to use. Okay, yes, sir. I'm sorry if I missed this, but how did this solve the prefix problem? This was the uh, aha moment for me in computer science. Look at this and see if there's ever gonna be a situation where there'll be any ambiguity. Try to construct two codes back to back that could be interpreted as some other two or three letters or whatever. Oh see if that ever happens. Is there any ambiguity here? Is it possible to construct a message where you can't tell what the letters are? Remarkably, the Huffman coding scheme has the prefix property. Now, you're probably wondering, how is that possible? And if you think about it real hard for a couple of hours, you'll realize it has to do with the structure of this binary tree. So that is the entire key to Huffman coding.